Hello, 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 my good friends, my comrades, my cohorts, as it were. Welcome back to the RimWorld Gun Empire series. Today, my friends, we have a lot to do. To really get us started here with this episode, I'm coming in hot with a brand new mod. It would seem, based on the comments on last episode, everyone kind of agrees that a good goal for the end of this series is taking over the Mountain Devil Mafia, so I've actually ended up adding the Empire mod. Now, personally, I still don't have a lot of experience with this mod, but I am aware somewhat of what it is like. Essentially, we'll be able to create other colonies or take over other settlements and turn into our colonies just as we normally would, but we'll actually be able to have them kind of almost like a passive income, somewhat of an empire that we actually rule. It's uh, very interesting based on what I've seen. But now that we have the explanation of the new mod out of the way as well as the end goal for the series, I would also like to begin working on a new little project, something of some armor for Shinichi. In particular here, I've actually created a brand new type of helmet for Shinichi that I feel is more fitting for a leader. On top of that, I'm also giving him a new rifle, a new sword, and a rocket launcher, and his pistol as well, of course, because he is a jack of all trades. Personally, I think that he looks much more devilish and much more of a fitting leader in this new attire with the helmet here, of course, and also it offers a lot more protection than his previous combat armor helmet. Just as well, of course, with all the new weapons, he should be much more versatile on the battlefield. Now that that's completed, I also decided on a new research project. This time around, we're going with concealed defenses, which will actually allow us to build a concealed barricade as well as a turret, basically something we can pop out anytime we like, to my understanding. Then, of course, we would also begin working on some car parts, because today I would like to begin building a brand new vehicle for us. Though, a little bit of a spoiler alert here, unfortunately, I didn't realize the vehicle's size, and I didn't build build enough car parts right from the get-go here, so we have to make some more later. Uh, while we were doing this, though, we did finish up that defense project, which also means it's time for me to pick another research project. This time around, we're going with combat vehicles, which is very fitting for what we're building, right? Specifically, I wanted to build the Wissant, I believe is how you pronounce it, essentially a very large transport truck for troops or goods and products or both. Essentially, my thought process here is we're going to need a large enough vehicle to transport all of our mercenaries, right? We can't just have them marching up and down the roads every time we go and try and take a new settlement. Although, of course, we're not going to be able to resolve that issue if we're not able to build this brand new large truck, right? And we're not going to be able to do that currently because our resources are just a teeny tiny bit depleted. Now, I know what you're thinking. Rat Knight, you are a smart, handsome young lad and you specifically put in the mod that allows you to set up camps. I know what you're going to do. You're going to go set up a camp and start mining some hills, right? Well, unfortunately, my friends, sometimes I can be a little bit lazy and we have plenty of money. I thought it'd be easier to send out a caravan to buy some steel if we don't hit a beco on the way. Okay, looks like we're good. Anyhow, we're actually going to go out and purchase some steel from the rebels and the marshals. Now, as I was mentioning, it is completely free for us to go out and set up a camp and start mining out hills, but it takes a very long time. Uh, people begin trying to have mental breaks, because they don't like camping out with no pretty sights around. You know, it's a whole shit show sometimes. But you know, most of the weapons that we're trading here were actually won in battle, not created by us. So technically they were completely free and we're getting these resources for selling them. And by that math and logic, these resources are kind of sort of free. As we were making our way towards the rebel settlements to do a little bit of trading with them, we actually finished up the combat vehicles research that we were working on, so now it's time for us to begin making more car parts, as I was talking about earlier, because I made a little oopsie in my calculations. We didn't need too much, maybe a few more wheels, some more engine blocks, as well as another fuel tank, and with that, we had enough parts to actually build it, we just needed the steel now. As we were waiting on Scott to return home with all the steel that he had been trading for, though, we had some outlines that were here looking for him, possibly maybe trying to strike up a deal or something of that sort about some weapons, perhaps. But this conversation was ended abruptly when I noticed that we had a raid from the Confederacy of Bana, who were apparently attacking us in three separate groups. Obviously, of course, among these three separate groups, there were quite a few soldiers, the standard uh, Death Squad members, the armored soldiers, and yada yada, but I did notice that there was a higher concentration of makeshift weaponry among these tribal 
warriors. We're still unsure as to where they're getting these weapons, but I do have a feeling it may very well be the Mountain Devils. I would suppose that that does make the most sense. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, as they say. Speaking of enemies, we do still have quite a few here on the battlefield that we are now engaging with our auto cannon turrets, turning them into Swiss cheese very promptly. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough room in the pillbox for all of our soldiers to begin firing out of, of course, so I brought a few of our mercenaries here to the front lines, taking cover behind some of our turrets. However, I would decide to pull that same cheeky little trick that we used on the Mountain Devils last episode, where I would gather all of our mercenaries up into our little garage tunnel here, and then slam the door wide open, opening fire on them with a hell Mary of bullets. Or at least, you know, that was the idea. Unfortunately, by the time all of our mercenaries had finally made it up here, most of our enemies had been dealt with by the turrets, and they bled out here in the snow. But of course, you know damn well that wasn't about to stop us from trying to pick off many of these stragglers here as they were trying to flee the area through the other tunnel. In the end, a few of them did end up getting away, unfortunately, but that's quite all right. Let them go out and spread word and fear of us among their peers. A couple of their peers were still lying out on the battlefield alive, even after having uh, many, many holes in many different places that holes should not be. So, of course, we ended up taking them back into our prison, where we would begin tending to them. Once that was completed, we would actually begin trying to recruit them. Even after several of these bodies have hit the ground, we're not even a step closer to finding out who's supplying them with all these shitty little weapons. You know, come to think of it, these weapons are extremely horrible. I wonder if we could supply them with better weapons and maybe get them to convert over to SNRology, if you will. Let me know what you guys think about that. Should we try to win over the Confederacy of Bana and become their gun dealer? Several hours after we got done hauling everything in from the battle, Scott and Ruland had finally returned home with a holy shit ton of silver as well as a lot of steel. Finally, we had a good bit more of our main resource and we were back in business, but better yet, with some of that steel, we would actually be able to complete the brand new vehicle that we've been wanting to build. The Wiscent was born. Please someone leave a vehicle name in the comment section down below as well, that way I can change it. This little bad mamma jamma can carry just over quadruple the amount of people that the rifle runner can, making it the perfect vehicle to carry the majority of our soldiers out on these icy cold desert roads all the way to our new mission. If you watched the last episode, you may remember towards the end, I actually showed a bounty that was put out for one of the mountain devils by one of the leaders in the Outlands. Well, apparently the safe house isn't too awful far from our home, so we decided that we're going to go down there and collect the bounty and destroy that damn safe house and eradicate any of the Mafia members that we find nearby. The road was long and winding, but it wasn't too bad to traverse with our brand new vehicle, of course. Uh, once we got a little bit closer to the mountains, we went off-road, and I could see why they decided to hide out here, a very isolated spot between the hills. The perfect hiding spot if you're running away from Big Daddy or any of the other scavenger or slaver gangs of the Outlands, but not so much from the SNR Rifle Company who live just up the road from you and very well may have their private army contracted to come and murder you. Mm, piss poor planning, I must say. The small safe house was nothing spectacular. All they really had were a bunch of soldiers except for this rocket turret, which we would have to be sure to stay out of range of. Should be easy enough in theory. Now, none of our mercenaries have any handheld weapons that would be out of range of the turret, but also have the turret within range, so this seemed like the perfect job for our army armadillo who could do just that. The armadillo's range was just outside of the turret's range and our massive cannon would immediately begin bombarding it as well as any soldiers that came out to try and take cover behind the sandbags. I unloaded all of our mercenaries and immediately had them run behind the armadillo and its massive steel plated armor that way they could take cover and fire at the enemies at the same time. As we were fighting of course we were pushing the enemy back a good bit so we would actually have them move up taking cover behind the Sand Viper instead now, but this did cause the Sand Viper to take heavy fire, and unfortunately we ended up losing it during the battle, having to take cover now behind some runes. The Armadillo was out of ammo, but we would use it to push forward and for cover for our soldiers once more as they pushed forward of course, but you may notice something. Pause for dramatic effect. Allow me to zoom in here for you. That way we can make out the pixels that this young strapping impid is holding, of course. Unfortunately, your eyes do not deceive you. That is indeed a doomsday rocket launcher, and I didn't notice it. 
and it very quickly engulfed our entire mercenary fleet. Thankfully, it mostly hit on the outskirts of all of our soldiers, and that was the last enemy that we had to battle, but unfortunately, it did take down four of our men. We very swiftly began trying to stomp out the fires that had engulfed them, as well as tend to their wounds to ensure that they wouldn't die. As we were doing that, we would also go to the base, destroy that explosive turret, and begin killing any enemies that still remained on the battlefield. And as the lives of our four injured soldiers kind of hangs in the balance here, I just want to say, yes, this operation went to shit very quickly, and it is my fault because I wasn't paying attention, unfortunately. The entire series could have ended right there. Well, not really, but we would have had to have started over from scratch with all the people that we would have had to have recruited and stuff, so this story very well could go very differently if I'm not cautious. By morning, I was beginning to wonder why we hadn't received payment for the bounty quest, but it turns out we had to destroy the only vehicle that the Mafia members had here. Once we'd done that, they actually sent us the payment back at the base. Not only that, but it does also state that they sent us a little bit of a bonus reward, which will be nice for our mercenaries to see, assuming that they don't die of infection or anything on the very long journey all the way back. Because we lost the Sand Viper during the raid as well, unfortunately it's going to take a much longer time for us to get back home than it actually took originally for us to come down here because some of our people are having to walk. On top of that, it is currently winter time, so the snow is making things a little bit more difficult. In the meantime, I did decide to check back at the base, and it would appear that they did actually pay us the 80-something gold that we were owed for the bounty, and I think that the bonus gift here might have been the cigars. I tried to check the history messages, and it didn't specify what the bonus was, but this was the only thing I don't remember us having. If we hadn't planned on conquering the Mountain Devils, I would almost say that safe house raid was a complete bust, because all we got for our efforts was some gold and cigars when we got four of our people severely injured with shattered legs and missing limbs and shit, and uh, we also lost our sand viper, but I guess we'll call it a win. For several days, I just kind of took care of the base up until the mercenaries had finally returned home. After they got back, they immediately pulled into the garage and began dropping off all of their cargo, which wasn't much more than weapons and things like that that we got from the raid. At the very least, we can sell those weapons for a lot of silver, of course, so it does make the raid a little bit more bearable. For me, of course, not for the mercenaries. That was a very stressful situation, so much in fact that Fox and Larone actually got into a social fight. From what I understand, Larone actually blame the entire Doomsday Rocket Launcher event on Fox because of the mangled scar he has on his brain, saying that that was the reason he didn't see it, something like that. Regardless though, after smacking each other around for a while, they ended up working out their differences. Truth be told, of course, I'm just glad that we all made it back home alive, even though several of our people were pretty injured with some shredded scars and missing limbs. Getting back to business per usual, though, uh, you may notice our batteries are looking a little bit depleted, so I'm actually going to begin some research on an advanced geothermal power generator. It's pretty straightforward, just as the name would suggest, it is the geothermal power generator, but advanced, basically an advanced form of it that can generate more power. But obviously, of course, that research is going to take us a teeny tiny bit of time. So in the meantime, I'm actually going to send out Scott and Rulant to do a teeny tiny bit of trading with the rebels, and once they're actually finished there, I'm going to have them begin working on some roads. We're just going to be purchasing a little bit more resources here and there, and then we're actually going to be connecting up our main road that goes through the Rebel territory to one of their major highways. I did realize that Scott and Rulant being the only ones working on the road was taking a very long time, so I actually ended up sending out several of our mercenaries in the Wiscent to come out and help them. There are a few different reasons that I do want to set up this road connection, of course, because because we've been cut off from the major rebel settlements out this way, of course, as well as a few of the martial ones since the territory kind of crosses over once you go a little bit north from here. Uh, so, of course, that's going to open us up to trade with them pretty easily. But also, this is the same road that will actually connect up with the Mountain Devil's main settlements as well. And if we expect to try and conquer them, that does indeed mean that we're going to have to be able to get over here pretty conveniently. I will say I kind of underestimated the project a little bit 
it from the get-go and I didn't expect to have to feed this many people for this amount of time, so we actually ended up stopping in at a Marshall service settlement and purchasing some food. All they really had were some ruined beef scraps that somebody over-fried on a grill, but I suppose it's nutrition enough. And after that, now starts the longest, most tedious part, trying to connect the Rebel settlements to the Mountain Devil settlements up this way, of course, in the northern section. That way it's going to be extremely convenient for us to ride through this little dirt highway that we're building and start conquering. Of course, at some point, I would like to try and upgrade the roads that we're currently building. That may be after we end up conquering a few of these settlements, though. That way we can establish a very quick road in case those settlements actually need our help. But that's going to be a little while because, as you can see, this little dirt path we're currently building is taking forever. So long, in fact, that Downs had finally finished her extensive research into advanced geothermal power, which was perfect because now we could get rid of one of the geothermal generators that we were actually using and replace it with an advanced one. Of course, to do so, though, we would actually need to have a Biko here begin creating some advanced components for us, as it would require four for the new geothermal power technology. Once we finally had four of those created, though, it was time for us to remove the previous geothermal power generator, and we had Fox do that, as he actually has the highest construction skill, with Richard and everyone else actually being out working on the road. Which was fine, but Fox was a little bit slower at moving and stuff because of uh, the mangled scar, as we talked about. It did eventually get finished though, and as you can see, the advanced geothermal generator actually makes a lot more power than the normal one. So the advanced one is putting out about 7,500 watts of power, and a normal one puts out about 3,600. So essentially just over double the output of a standard one, so now we have two for the price of, well, uh, an advanced one, I suppose. I also wanted to mention by this point, we've also ended up recruiting three new people into the ranks of our mercenaries. I've done the best I could with their armor and whatnot. We tried to make them some light combat armor, but I didn't really have enough for any helmets. They'll make wonderful additions to the company, though, of course. By this point, with any pawns, because we just have so many people that can do cooking and cleaning and crafting and construction and all the skills and things that we really need done, my criteria for new mercenaries is basically just whether or not they can fight and if they're decent at it enough. Not too far away, though, our boys in green have finally completed the massive dirt path highway that we've been working on, and as you can see from this little diagram that I ended up making, these are the roadways that we're now connected to. As you can see circled in green, that's where the base is, and this yellow roadway is basically the brand new road that we've actually created that's going and skirting through Marshall and Rebel territory directly through the Outlands right into where the Mountain Devils are. It also leads down into the Thromboian Union territory. You'll also notice that the Outlands here don't really have any roads. Obviously, they don't really have any infrastructure through the Outlands, nor really through the Thromboian Union territory, except for some paths that maybe the tribes know about. But like I mentioned earlier, this new Dirt Path Highway is going to help us a lot with trade with many of these major settlements out this way of course, but also with our mission of conquest. Of course, we're not the only ones that have noticed the new superhighway we've created, though Marshall and Rebel newspapers are all writing about it, as well as talking about it on their propaganda radio shows. It would seem that they're all pretty overjoyed with us being connected to the main lands on both sides now, of course, and being able to do trade more efficiently. Everyone finally returned home several hours later, and unfortunately for them, the work does not stop because now that they're home, I actually have a defensive project I would like for them to work on. I'm sure you guys remember, early in the video, I actually finished the research for deployable barriers as well as turrets, so we're actually going to begin trying to utilize that technology. In particular, we're going to begin giving the turrets a try within the tunnel that we dug last episode. I've noticed a lot of enemies, of course, travel through the tunnel just as we had anticipated, so I thought it would be very interesting to put some turrets in here. That way, when enemies are coming through, we could deploy them to fight with them. We also ended up having to build a power switch because the way that these turrets actually work is when they are powered at all, they will actually be deployed. And if they have no power, they will sink back into the floor tile and not be, you know, attackable by enemies. And they also will not attack, of course. So when the power is on, they're up and raised. And when it is off, they are down. 
I think this new technology is going to be perfect for ambushing enemies in the tunnel anytime we feel the need to. It's also very useful that the tunnel is very dark, they're not even going to know that those turrets are there until it's too late for them. Something I would like to try later on is maybe using deployable barriers to try and lock the enemies within the tunnel and then deploying the turrets to fire at them. Kind of like a kill box, but uh, not really. More like a kill tunnel. Anyhow though, sticking with the theme of improving our defenses, I noticed that the pillbox gets a lot of action during raids, but we don't really have enough room for all of our mercenaries. So near at one of our turrets here, I've decided to dig through the mountain and add some embrasures as well as some walls for cover, and this way we can actually use it something like a pillbox, but not exactly. It's a bit smaller of course, but it should help us out with fitting more people into the battles. Just as well of course I ended up bringing our anti-aircraft guns over since they have such a short range. I also noticed that everyone was beginning to get a teeny tiny bit bored with the poker and billiards, which makes sense. We have an entire private army only playing two games, so we actually ended up building a table for the Five Finger Knife game as well as two arcade machines. Ah, the luxuries of being a gun for hire under the SNR Rifle Company. Truly, we treat our mercenaries with the utmost respect and give them the finer things in life. They are so lucky. They didn't get to enjoy their new arcade machines for very long, though, as we ended up having a solar flare, and this began to get me thinking, you know, what if we were to get a raid or something to that effect, just a massive attack by even a manhunter pack or something, where our army is out doing something and then our turrets get hit with a solar flare, Downs and the others would be completely screwed. There has to be something we can do about that. We could build turrets and whatnot until we're blue in the face, but they're not going to do any good without power, and we can build solar panels and the most advanced of geothermal power generators, but a solar flare still stops all that. Luckily for you guys, the Rat Daddy has planned for this very event. Early on, I knew this might be an issue that occurred later on into the series, so I actually have the EMI shielding mod, the solar flare shield mod, already installed, and we're actually going to begin working on EMI shielding as our research project. While Downs is working on that, we're going to begin attending to a little bit of a quest here. Through our radio terminal, we've actually been intercepting messages between the Rebels about a nearby item stash. It would appear that it's rumored to hold 13 of the best medicine on the entire planet. As you can imagine, I wasted absolutely no time dispatching our military units to go out and begin trying to collect this medicine from the item stash, although there could be a threat around any corner. As we were taking our massive new truck, trying to traverse throughout these small hills, we were actually intercepted by a Thromboian Union Mechanitor, Mechaniter, whatever they're called. There were two recon mechs along with them, and they were blasting the shit out of our vehicle, so of course we ended up getting out very swiftly and began firing at them. First and foremost, we would try to focus on the mechs as they were the more dangerous with their charge weaponry, but of course Shinichi would lob a few grenades at the Mechaniter themselves. Once he was down, we would have our soldiers surround him, and we thought about questioning him or maybe even capturing him to have him join the mercenaries, but instead we decided to strip him and then begin firing at him. An execution seemed fitting given the circumstances. Turns out though this handsome young fella had a reusable mech link that was in his brain. I don't know if the helmet put it there or how it got there, but apparently we could take it out and take it back home with us. I guess we'll decide on who gets the mech link in the future. We still have a lot of mech tech we would have to research first anyhow. We would then send our soldiers in to cautiously begin clearing the area as well as checking out the actual item stash itself. Turns out the rumors were correct. There was indeed 13 Glitter World Medicine in here, which would be very useful. And of course, with that being said, the only thing that was left to do now was for us to load everything back up into the truck and then begin heading back home, which of course we did. Just after returning home, Downs and Jet had finally finished their research into the EMI shielding, so now we're going to be able to build a solar flare shield. But before we do that, looks like like we have a wedding. Ah yes, it would appear that Kirkos and Min are finally tying the knot, a beautiful spectacle to behold right here in our very own dining room. Though I do love this much more than any old solar flare shield, unfortunately love is not going to save us from the sun's radiation, so we need to get back to business. Shinichi would come into Down's lab where he would then finish up the solar flare shield. Now we shouldn't have any issues or any worries about all of our power grid and electronics shutting down while we're away on a mission. Or in general for that matter. And now that that is no longer a concern, it is time for us to begin stockpiling a few things such as fuel. Now there is a big reason I want to do this and I am ready to announce it. We are now going to begin conquering
battling the Mountain Devils. Yes, indeed, in this episode, right now. We're loading up and prepping all of our vehicles and weapons and everything that we're going to need. Now, originally, I didn't want to do this this episode, or I wanted to, but I hadn't planned on it, I suppose, especially after we had lost the Sand Viper. But I am extremely eager, just as well as very anxious, to at the very least try to conquer one of their settlements in this episode, of course. Besides, now would honestly be the perfect time, as we would still somewhat have the element of surprise. They wouldn't know that we've built this road specifically to try and come and conquer them, most likely they would think that it's for trade purposes, as most of all we do is trade. They also wouldn't be expecting us to try and capture one of their settlements and maintain our control over it since our main base is so far away. It would be suicide, it would be stupid, and it would be crazy. And that's exactly why we're going to do it. We're going to be starting off with one of their minor settlements here that's actually just on the outskirts of their controlled territory, of course. Now, even though this is a minor settlement, it is a pretty Pretty decent size, I would say. They have some okay defenses for the most part, with a handful of turrets as well as a very large artillery gun right in the middle of the base. And obviously, of course, it goes without saying that the place is absolutely crawling with these damn mountain devils every which way. There was, however, one mountain devil in particular that actually ended up catching my eye. He appeared to be a familiar face, but I knew he couldn't be because we killed him last episode. Looks like we have the Duke Commando's son here. Command Jr. Though he doesn't appear to hold any status or ranking within the Mafia. He, along with his many comrades, would hardly be any concern to me. The only thing I was actually concerned about, and very concerned at that, was this refurbished infantry tank that they were working on. Not to fear though, I assumed we might see some type of vehicle, so I actually loaded several of our mercenaries up with explosive weaponry. Besides, I'm sure the armadillo would eat this bastard for breakfast. Speaking of which, before the battle actually began, of course, I would need to come up with something of a game plan. I brought the rifle runner and our new large truck down, got all of our soldiers out, and then began getting them into position just before I would actually unload the artillery along with several shells, and we would also begin putting those into position as well. For the time being, we are going to begin holding our fire until everyone else was ready, though, of course. I was extremely afraid that their refurbished tank would catch us off guard, so I had the armadillo come around along with Shinichi and two of our other soldiers who were equipped with rocket launchers, just getting ready in case it does get to us very quickly. I would have the men come down and group up with the tank just behind this small rock formation that's not too far from the settlement. After waiting for several hours, then the battle really began. I would lead with the armadillo tank here, trying to take out the turrets that were on the outskirts of their base, that way they couldn't injure any of our people, having the soldiers come behind it, using it as cover, firing their rockets at any of the foolish mafia devils that came out. Hearing all the commotion now, the others knew it it was time to get into position as well the artillery knew it was time to fire and they began letting shells off into the air. As the shells began pounding the base just as well as the armadillo's massive turret, the refurbished tank showed its ugly face. Unfortunately, it did have a much farther range on its cannon than the armadillo, so we would end up trying to hide behind the small rocks once more until it actually came closer. As we were waiting for the perfect moment to pop out and attack the tank, we had several enemies who were coming around this rock formation, and they were just dying to get turned into a fine red mist by our automatic gunfire, so of course we happily obliged. Even though we were quickly getting cornered by the enemies, I still felt that the odds were in our favor. Finally, as their tank came out from behind cover, Fox and the the armadillo would immediately begin engaging it with the cannon, and we had an all-out tank battle. Of course, though, I would try to bring our soldiers out with their heavy artillery as well to attack it, and eventually we did destroy it, but we quickly had to get out of the armadillo. This was a grave mistake. The armadillo couldn't move, but immediately after Fox got out, he ended up getting blown up. Unfortunately, as the grueling battle continued, Fox's death would quickly be followed up by Abikos, who was also blown up. We were boxed in, but we had finally killed or injured enough of the enemies that they had actually began fleeing, thank God. As the enemies were fleeing, we would quickly grab our wounded and run and try to hide, that way they didn't see us and start shooting at us and we could try to avoid any more deaths. Which also, of course, meant that we couldn't fire at any of them as they were fleeing, which also meant that Commando Jr. here would end up leaving the area safely. 
A shame, but not to worry, he'll see his father sooner rather than later. As the ice-cold rain began falling from the sky upon our weary heads, we were attempting to tend to our wounded to avoid any further casualties, of course. Once we had completed that little task, we also sent a very small task force in to try and clear the area around the settlement, just as well we began putting out any fires that we found as well. Though the place is pretty damn shitty, we do want to try to save any infrastructure that we can if we're going to call this place home. And this place is indeed going to be home, well, at least our second home, and the home for many of our soldiers now that the battle is finally over and we have arose victorious. Finally, our conquest has begun, truly began, and our first battle was a complete victory. Of course, though, we were not without our losses. But this is a war. Sacrifices are expected. Now that we finally conquered this settlement, we will actually claim it as our own, our stronghold within the enemy territory. A bright, beautiful, shining light at the end of a deep, dark abyss. With our home being claimed now, though, it's time for us to lay our dead to rest. We would end up digging two small, shallow graves not too far from the new settlement where we would actually bury Fox and Abiko's lifeless corpses. Their sacrifices will not go in vain, nor have they already. Their blood and souls were the price that we had to pay, unfortunately. Now, we do need to build a road to the main road from the settlement here, of course, so that's immediately what we began doing to ensure that if we do need aid pretty urgently, we can make sure that we can at least try to get here pretty quickly. Though, of course, truth be told, obviously the main base is very far away, so if shit hits the fan, they're gonna have to defend themselves. Although, they are in pretty good hands, as we have appointed Otto as the leader of this new settlement. As well, as our albeit broken and injured soldiers that we've left behind to take care of the place in our absence temporarily. They, of course, are going to be tasked with taking care of the new settlement, but also trying to build it back up, essentially, so they immediately would begin cutting down some trees, as wood here is very vibrant and very available, unlike there in the Noquan Desert. Which, of course, makes it the perfect resource to use to build this place back up. Now, as they were leaving, the Mountain Devils forgot to take quite a few things with them, one of which, of of course were their dirt bikes that they actually left here. These are still part of their faction and we did actually have the option to try and board one so I thought ah what the hell so I let one of our people get on it and I couldn't get them back off for some reason. So I actually ended up having to have another soldier come over with his sword and beat the shit out of the dirt bike until it fell apart and then we had our soldier back. Very weird. Because of this and the fact that I couldn't claim these dirt bikes for us of course I decided that they weren't really good for much more than scrap metal so we immediately began beating the shit out of them until they fell apart into some gold components and other parts. Because the foolish mountain devils actually left so many resources behind in their wake as they were fleeing the settlement, we actually would get a pretty good start here with a geothermal generator to boot. That should really help us out since we don't have to bother building any of these smaller power production areas like solar panels or a fueled power generator or things like that of course. Then for a time we would just kind of work on some improvements around the base like repairing certain structures, building onto them with more wooden walls, we built some batteries, just some different things like that, and we would also end up deconstructing many of the walls and floors and whatnot that we wouldn't need. But my friends, we are winding down to the end of the episode here, and I just want to thank you guys ever so much for watching today's episode. I truly do hope that you've enjoyed. I had a lot of fun with this one. We had a lot of violence going on, a lot of raiding and attacking and stuff like that, so, you know, that's always fun. <laughs> I, always, uh, I always really enjoy the, uh, the battles and whatnot, of course, so... I'm also very proud because I feel like we have made a lot of progress today. Sure, this is only one settlement, but it is literally the biggest milestone I think we've accomplished thus far in our goal, of course. Taking another faction settlement is no small feat. But obviously, of course, we do have many, many more of their settlements to go as well, but uh, we'll get around to that, and of course, we may not end up capturing every single one of them. I'll have to see how the taxes and stuff work through the Empire mod, uh, which I also also need to set up our faction for, which I think I'll end up doing sometime in the next episode. But for today, my friends, once again, thank you for watching. I love you guys ever so much, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.